Hi, uh, my name's Andrew. I describe myself as a Tectona groupie. I don't actually have a formal role with the organisation, but I'm a great fan of everything that Tectona does and uh, always keen to support anything that she does, particularly in this rather difficult time. So um, this is my little contribution to provide some entertainment uh, for you while we're in lockdown. And uh, it's a story about Plymouth, uh, about a particular boat, and about one man's fantastic, heroic, historical achievements. Um, and I'm actually doing it sitting on my own boat. My own boat is a white plastic boat, not a nice teak wooden boat like Tectona. Uh, but my boat has a small part to play in the story as well. So if you keep watching to the end, you'll see, see what that is. So here's the story. This is what Plymouth looks like when you come in from the sea. You can see uh, Smeaton's Tower there. Maybe we've been out for a trip on Tectona, wouldn't that be nice? And uh, over to the west, there's a little dock there, um, over by the waterfront pub, uh, where the red arrow is indicating, that's uh, West Ho. And if you go down to that dock, you'll find this plaque, in memory of a guy called Francis Chichester. And on the 28th of May, 1967, this old photograph shows you what was going on on the Ho. So if you ask anybody uh, over a certain age who was in Plymouth on that day in May 1967, where were, we, where were you on that day? They give you a slightly sort of strange look and they say, well, obviously I was on the Ho. Or they give you a good excuse why they weren't there. And you'll find that people from miles around give you the same answer as well. It was an enormous uh, event and uh, uh, hard to imagine really how you could create something on that magnitude without the benefit of social media, but it shows you how uh, how, how big an event it was. So the question is, what were they all looking at? Well, here's the next part of the story. They're looking at a big flotilla of boats stretching out across Plymouth Sound, and then a lone yachtsman emerges. Let's hear what the uh, commentator is saying at this point. While all this goes on, Sir so Francis Chichester sits quietly in, in the cockpit, stands in the cockpit, waving to the people as he goes past, with his, still wearing his oil skins, that inevitable peak cap, and all round him these myriads and myriads of boats. Thousands of people must be here. Now he's past the breakwater. He's past that imaginary finishing line that he set himself nine months ago. So this was Francis Chichester arriving back in Plymouth, having sailed solo all the way around the world, starting in Plymouth, stopping just once in Sydney, and arriving back in Plymouth. A remarkable achievement. No one really knew whether it was possible to uh, to do this, and uh, he did it. And there was a big crowd there to welcome him. The wind slowly drops away, and the procession moves down past the buoys marking the deep water channel in Plymouth Sound. And so, in the fading light, the flotilla heads towards West Ho. Vast crowds, 250,000 of them, mass on Plymouth Ho, this natural amphitheatre looking out over the sound to cheer Sir Francis Chichester home on his last half mile. Their welcome roaring across the water. Meet again for the first time for 190 days after his epic single handed voyage. Eventually, they transfer him to another boat and bring him over to uh, West Ho. And he takes his first uh, wobbly steps ashore and waves to the crowd and uh, becomes a national hero. So we saw uh, Francis Chichester stepping ashore there in uh, West Ho with that little little dock there down by the uh, the waterfront pub. Um, that unfortunately is all silted up now, so it's not really in use. But my recollection is that they actually changed the TV news schedule in order to be able to bring that event live, which is very very unusual um, in those days. That's that's how big the event was. And um, after the, the events after that, the reception in the Guildhall, and he was actually knighted in public. Uh, by the Queen using Drake's own sword, which is uh, another amazing uh, big public event. So he was a, a huge hero of, of our time. Um, so, uh, well, what sort of man was he? What, uh, what was he doing before that? And so here's the next uh, part of this interesting story. Francis Chichester is perhaps best described as an adventurer. The son of a Devon clergyman, he travelled extensively as a young man and by the 1930s he was making his name as an aviator flying solo across oceans. Here he is with a de Havilland Moth flying boat. He called his plane Gypsy Moth, and this is Gypsy Moth too. He had some pretty bad experiences, 
and escaped alive from some spectacular crashes. During the Second World War, his experience as a navigator was useful to the RAF, and by the 1950s he'd taken up the slightly safer pastime of sailing, but still with an eye on adventure. In 1960 he was one of the five solo sailors that set sail from Plymouth in the first single-handed transatlantic race. This effectively jump-started the sport of solo ocean racing and opened the way for people like Eric Tabley, Alan MacArthur, Pete Goss and Alex Thompson to write new chapters in the history of sailing across oceans. So he was an aviator that moved on to sailing. Uh, his adventures and misadventures of, uh, as an aviator are uh, told about in this, this book, uh, Alone Across the Tasman Sea. And I enjoyed reading this because it had lots of references to celestial navigation, navigating by the sun, the moon and the stars, which is what you had to do in the days before GPS, um, and you, if you were trying to go across an ocean. And uh, I subsequently learned all about that when I uh, became a Merchant Navy navigator in the 1970s. So that's kind of another, another link between me and the, the Chichester story. So, what about the big voyage, the one that uh, led to that uh, heroic return to Plymouth? He set himself the target of sailing single-handed around the world, stopping only once. Although a solo circumnavigation had been completed a long time before by a guy called Joshua Slocum, he had stopped many times along the way to recover. The route that Chichester would take was what's now the classic Vendée Globe route via the Cape of Good Hope, across the Southern Ocean and back up the Atlantic by rounding Cape Horn. This in fact was the route taken by the fast clipper sailing vessels carrying tea from the Far East back to Europe in days gone by. Chichester set himself the target of sailing as fast as these large vessels and to do this he needed a specially designed vessel which he called Gypsy Moth 4. When he reached his planned stopover in Sydney, both he and the boat were in a pretty bad state. This is, a, this is him on board with his wife. Everyone begged him to give up, but he carried on. He went out into the Tasman Sea, survived a knockdown and headed for Cape Horn. Cape Horn was one of the big unknowns, renowned for its vicious westerly gales. Even large vessels would find it hard to get past this obstacle. When he got there, he was really annoyed to find that the public interest in his voyage resulted in the Royal Navy sending a ship to intercept him, and a newspaper hired a plane to do a flyover. This really annoyed Chichester, and he said it was like being a Piccadilly Circus. But it produced some spectacular footage, which created even more interest in what he was attempting to do. search was in progress and HMS Protector stood by in an attempt to sight Gypsy Moth as she rounded the horn. On March the 20th she was sighted on Protector's radar screen and soon the lookout spotted her sailing under a storm jib the size of a bath towel lashed by salt spray and at times lost from sight behind gigantic waves. The eagerly awaited news was flashed round the world. And so he got round Cape Horn and headed up the Atlantic, homeward bound for the spectacular welcome back in Plymouth, which we, which we looked at a few moments ago. So uh, here's another book, Gypsy Moth Circles the World. And this looks a bit sort of old and battered, doesn't it? Well, that's because it was a Christmas present from my mum and dad uh, when I was a schoolboy and the, uh, the price was 35 shillings, that's less than two pounds in uh, uh, today's money. And the reason it's a bit battered is because it's quite old, it's the first edition, and it's actually done about 2,000 miles on the boat itself, which is another part of the interesting story I'm going to tell you. And um, let, me, let me read a couple of um, uh, pieces from the book which will tell you a lot about, uh, about Chichester. Um, this is in, in chapter one. He says, as the years passed, this urge to circle the world alone lay dormant in me, like a gorse seed which will lie in the earth for fifty years until the soil is stirred to admit some air or light, and the seed suddenly burgeons. It's like the old-fashioned language, but uh, it was obviously a dream that he, he was having. And uh, as you see, one of the key moments in the voyage was rounding Cape Horn, and 
people do that more routinely nowadays, they actually race around the world. But in those days, nobody actually knew if it was possible for anybody to do that and survive. And um, this is what he writes um, uh, in this book. I told myself for a long time that anyone who tried to round the horn in a small yacht must be crazy. Of the eight yachts I knew to have attempted it, six had been capsized or somersaulted before, during or after the passage. I hate being frightened, but even more, I detest being frightened by fr prevented by fright. At the same time, the horn had a fearsome fascination, and it offered one of the greatest challenges left in the world. So that tells you a lot about him. He was, he didn't really want to be afraid. Uh, he was an extremely brave guy. I mean, you might say foolhardy, but he was very, very brave to do what he did. So when he got back, he became a national hero, but he actually hated the boat. He really didn't want anything more to do with it. Uh, this is something that he, he wrote about the boat. He said it was too big, it needs a crew of three a man to navigate, the elephant to move the tiller, and a three foot six inch chimpanzee with arms eight feet long to get about below and work some of the gear. And uh, he just wanted nothing to do with it. And in fact, the boat was put in a dry dock next to Cutty Sark, and that's where it sat. So uh, now the story moves ahead by 40 years. Um, the Gypsy Moth 4 was put into a dry dock near the Cutty Sark in London and a bit of a sort of tourist attraction and he'd completely lost interest in the boat and uh, she actually started to rot away which is very very sad. Uh, I visited her um, some years back and uh, she was just a sorry stite. And uh, anyway, um, a project started to develop and uh, led by the UK Sailing Academy and the editor of Yachting Monthly the idea was to take her out of the dry dock, put her right, and sail around the world again to mark the 40th anniversary of Chichester's first voyage. And the idea for the voyage was to actually involve young people. So it had a lot of um, parallels with the work that uh, Tectona does in uh, using sailing to inspire uh, young people or people facing challenges in their life. And uh, the whole thing gathered a bit of momentum. And uh, as it was uh, gathering momentum, I became connected to it. Um, through my work at the university, we were talking to the UK Sailing Academy about career developments and that sort of thing, and I became aware of the project. And uh, in my usual way, I said, well, can I help in some way? And um, uh, my background professionally is um, as a meteorology and a large part of it. And so I was anointed um, by the guy who's uh, organising the project as the official meteorologist for the Gypsy Moth project. And so I got invited to... Um, uh, the, the uh, various events, launching the boat and uh, relaunching the boat and that kind of thing. And um, in fact, when I went to that uh, event, um, somebody came up to me and said, are you going to sail on the boat? And I said, well, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, but it turned out they were still looking for people to sail as first mate. So the next part of the story is that I sailed as first mate on Gypsy Moth 4 on the second circumnavigation. And here's that part of the story. Gypsy Moth 4 needed an enormous amount of work to put her right. Years of sitting in a dry dock had left her in a right mess. The project needed a lot of fundraising. There was a website driving all this with people's memories of Chichester, etc. I actually won a prize for writing an essay at school about Chichester while he was still alive. And this got added to the website as an example of how this sort of adventure can inspire the generations. And the second circumnavigation was going to take about 100 young people on a 30-leg voyage to mark the 40th anniversary of Chichester's original voyage. This is me at the launch at Camper and Nicholson's in Gosport. Um, and this is the ceremony on the foredeck. One of the youngsters there was a schoolboy from Plymouth who sailed on the first leg to Gibraltar. When he came back to Plymouth, he enrolled at the university where I taught him as an undergraduate and he's now a professional mariner. So, the formula really worked. After the relaunch, she went on to the Southampton Boat Show and she had the longest queues of any boat for people to go and visit her. Then it was off to Plymouth and here she is at QAB in 2005. 
The departure from Plymouth was covered live on Sky News, in colour, instead of the blurry black and white footage of her return 40 years previously. After 40 years in dry dock, the Gypsy Moth needed a £300,000 makeover before attempting a repeat of the historic trip. Off once again around the world. The last time Gypsy Moth 4 began this journey was back in 1966. On board then was Sir Francis Chichester. Today his fully restored vessel set sail with a crew of six, three of whom are youngsters, without any sailing experience, but a passion for adventure. All the people who've been involved in it, a tremendous cooperative effort, uh, and uh, it, it brings my father's memory and his achievements to a new generation. That's very good. The route for the second circumnavigation was very different to that taken by Chichester. It would definitely go nowhere near Cape Horn but a voyage of that length is bound to have some moments. Like this one, when she ended up on a reef in the Pacific, which nearly brought the project to a premature end. The rescue off the reef is another great story in itself. Around this time, I was getting myself through RYA Yachtmaster offshore with a commercial endorsement, and I found out I was going to sail three legs, which would include the Great Barrier Reef and the Mediterranean. So that didn't sound too bad. The adventure started for me when I met these two young chaps at Heathrow and flew with them to Brisbane. They were both inner city dwellers and had no previous sailing experience. This was to be our route up the east coast of Australia, which would take about five weeks. Now here's a photo to die for. But I also had official duties to perform. Actually, I think they just wanted someone to blame where the weather turned bad. The boat had been refurbished very well, and many of the old fittings were there. Here's the galley. And this was my bunk. Although she was designed for solo sailing, she actually had six berths as it was planned to use her as a boat for the family to enjoy when the voyage was over. This is a view looking aft and you can see how very narrow she is in the beam. In fact she's the same beam as my boat Bessie, even though she is 20 feet longer. And these are the original electronics and uh, radio receivers which I recognised from when I'd visited her in the dry dock in Greenwich all those years ago. The radio receiver panel lifted up to reveal a set of modern instruments behind. And this is the original Blake's heads. But she's a sailing boat and we certainly had some interesting sailing. How about this? So here's the uh, self steering gear. You can see it's working hard. They've got quite a, quite a big following sea, swell of 3 metres plus, winds of over 20 knots, apparent wind that is, and we're making, uh, we're making 8 to 10 knots at times surfing down the waves. So it really works, it does, does really work, it does an excellent job. You see why you have some uh, difficulty with it though, uh, to put it mildly, uh, I nearly lost my thumb twice, there's definitely one place where you shouldn't stick your thumb. And it's critically important to get everything lined up and having uh, two people working on the self-steering gear plus a reliable helmsman makes an enormous difference because you didn't have that, uh, that advantage. Now it was time to enjoy the incredible local scenery and do some Robinson Crusoe impressions as well as observing some spectacular marine creatures. The Chichester story is still remembered in Australia and we had crowds visiting the boat everywhere we stopped and lots of media attention too. This photo was taken when we had anchored in a quiet bay in the Whitsunday Islands to get out of the limelight. But even there some people from a nearby yacht rode over to ask is that the real Gypsy Moth 4? And they nearly died when we invited them on board for a cup of tea. My subsequent trip as first mate from Crete to Malta was also memorable in many ways. And here we are posing on the foredeck in the Grand Harbour in Valletta. 
So that was all a pretty remarkable experience. And um, you may have noticed that I'm wearing my, uh, where is it, my Gypsy Moth um, shirt. And uh, I've even got a, a Gypsy Moth hat. There we are. And uh, you may notice that uh, one of the sponsors of the project was uh, Mount Gay Rum. And uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, I slept most of the time in my bunk with uh, a crate of Mount Gay rum at my foot and we were able to dispense that for hospitality in the various ports that we visited, another interesting part of the story. So um, yeah, so I sailed the Great Barrier Reef and the Mediterranean um, and uh, after that of course the, the vessel had to continue her route back to the UK and in fact the very last part of the trip was very very challenging and uh, she just about made it into Foy the night before but arrived um, f 40 years to the day um, back in Plymouth and uh, here's the story of uh, her arriving back in Plymouth for the second time. So this is a photo I took from uh, from my boat, from the boat I'm sitting on now as I followed Gypsy Moth 4 in uh, to Plymouth Sound 40 years to the day from when Chichester made his uh, historic return. Uh, quite a moment really and uh, amazingly uh, we also got on the BBC main evening news at nine o'clock and uh, Bessie even actually makes a little cameo appearance, see if you can spot her. Forty years ago today, Sir Francis Chichester's famous yacht, the Gypsy Moth 4, completed a record-breaking voyage around the world. Now she's returned to port again after recreating that epic journey of 1967, but this time with a slightly different crew. Alex Bushell is in Plymouth for us. Alex. It was thought impossible, an unprecedented feat of endurance, bravery and skill. It's one of those achievements that's gone on to inspire generations of sailors ever since. And today, here in Plymouth, we went back in history to celebrate one man and one boat's achievement. Forty years to the day and Gypsy Moth 4 sails home. This 53-foot wooden yacht has travelled 30,000 miles, recreating Sir Francis Chichester's 1967 voyage. So uh, you saw me there chasing uh, Gypsy Moth 4 in in Bessie, the boat that I'm, I'm sitting in now. Um, I bought Bessie, the um, Do 436, uh, after returning from my, uh, my time on Gypsy Moth 4, having previously owned a 29-foot boat and then extensively sailed a 53-foot boat, I felt I needed something a little bit larger, so I've got a 36-foot boat. And um, the guy who was actually helming um, Bessie uh, as we were chasing Gypsy Moth 4 in, um, and I was uh, doing some videoing, a um, guy called Steve, who was one of my undergraduate students at the time, and he's now the uh, master of a large offshore vessel working in the Pacific for Swire, so he's a very successful um, career. And so, uh, yeah, here's my last book. Um, this is the, uh, the book about the second circumnavigation, uh, Gypsy Moth 4, A Legend Sails Again. And uh, as reflected early on in this, uh, Chichester was a dreamer. I mean, doing the voyage was a dream that he had. I'm personally not a dreamer. I'm a very pragmatic sort of person. And um, I wrote chapter 16 in this book, which is the uh, Malulabar to Cairns. Malulabar is somewhere near Brisbane. And uh, the first words of this is, um, here I was at last, living a dream I never actually had on board Gypsy Moth 4. So that's my sort of big takeaway from this. Um, you don't have to dream to achieve things, just take opportunities as they, they come along. And uh, if I'd ever dreamt as a schoolboy that I was going to sail on Gypsy Moth 4, I'd have woken up and said, well, don't be ridiculous, that'll never happen. But it really did. And uh, so this is a tribute to, uh, to a great man um, who uh, put Plymouth on the map, um, put that uh, plaque on the hoe, and uh, I hope you've enjoyed the story. <laughs>